close out our epic series. We're going to be talking about the book of Revelation. I've got a great friend named Jim Reynolds who's been an elder here from the beginning. And uh, I know for a fact this is Jim's favorite topic to talk about. So when we knew we were landing on this, I said, we got to get Jim to come up here and share with us. Would you give Jim a warm journey, church? Welcome. Good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning. Did you see Mike walk out on stage? Don't tell me God's not in the miracle business. Come on now. I almost cried back there, man. That's awesome. So I hope everybody had a good Christmas, right? Yeah? I got to ask you, though, did anybody get a car or a truck for Christmas? Nobody. You see those commercials with trucks and cars for Christmas? I mean, is that reality? Come on, really? Okay, anybody get a cat or a dog for Christmas? No cats or dogs either, wow. Did y'all get anything for Christmas? Okay. So a number of years ago, Sandy and I got a cat, Noel, for Christmas. Got him at Christmas, named him Noel, right? Makes sense. Noel was a great cat. You could hold Noel out like this, and he just, he trusted you. He would just hang there, arms out, all limp, put his little head down. He just, he was, he was putty in your arms. He just, he trusted you. And then we've had other cats, right? If you hold them out there like this, they scratch and they claw and they wiggle and they try to get out. They just don't trust us. And we've had cats who were kind of in the middle, right? Hold them out there a little bit. They're not comfortable there. They're not mad, but they're not comfortable. But they're willing to trust you for just a little bit. And I can't help but believe that that kind of paints a picture of we as believers in terms of our faith when we go through particularly trials and tribulations. Right? Some believers don't like going through that at all. They claw and they scratch and they wiggle and they just want to get out of the trial and the tribulation. Right? And other believers are a little more comfortable, don't want to really be there, but they're going to trust the Lord a little bit. And then there are those believers who are kind of like Noel believers. They just trust God. Amen. They trust God no matter what, no matter a trial or tribulation, they just trust him. Right? Amen. Can I ask you what kind of believer are you? Are you a Noel believer? Do you just trust God no matter what, through a trial or a tribulation? Are you comfortable in his presence? And I ask you that because I believe, friends, as we get closer to the last days and that great and terrible day of the Lord, we're all going to have to be Noel-type believers because it's going to get a little tough. Amen? Amen? All right. Don't go sour on me. It's going to get good here. Revelation is an awesome book. So here we go. As Pastor Eric said, we have now reached the end of the epic series, right? We started in Genesis, finished today in a great book called the Book of Revelation, right? We have come full circle. It's pretty fitting because the Book of Revelation, by anybody's definition, is clearly epic. 22 chapters of epic information and topics that are awesome to behold. Can you put, there it is. Notice it says Revelation. Singular, right? And if you've been in my class, you know this. Amen. It is not plural. There are no multiple revelations in this book. It's not the revelation of the false prophet, the antichrist, the mark of the beast. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ as king of kings and lord of lords, and that's it. There's one revelation in this book. That's all it is. One revelation. All 65 books of the Bible have been building to this. This has brought us to this day and this hour in this book. 65 books have been building to this one book. Almost 80% of the book of Revelation is referenced elsewhere in the Old Testament or New Testament. It all builds to this. And it is going to be truly epic. The end of the story, right? Or is it? Really, it's just the beginning of the story, isn't it? Right? In times of all time and eternity, this is really just the beginning. Revelation sets the stage for all time and eternity. It's not the end of the story. It's really just the beginning of the story. Praise God. Amen. So we're going to focus today on three scenes in this awesome book. Three scenes that now reveal Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Because the last time he was here, anybody remember? The ascension, right? He ascended before 11 disciples. That's hardly a kingdom, is it? That's hardly a throne. There were no subjects. There was no army. When he left, he left amongst 11 disciples. 
The book of Revelation will change all that. It will make him king of kings and lord of lords. That's what we're going to focus on today. Three scenes in this book that set him up as king of king and lord of lords. Now, there are some ties between Genesis and Revelation. So let's take a look at this. Genesis presented the beginning, Revelation the end of this earth. Notice the contrast. In Genesis, the earth was created. In Revelation, this earth passes away. In Genesis was Satan's first rebellion. In Revelation is Satan's last rebellion. In Genesis, sin entered the world. Praise God in Revelation, sin is no more. In Genesis, death entered the world. In Revelation, there is no more death. In Genesis, sorrow and suffering entered the world. Revelation will put an end to sorrow and suffering. I don't think you all heard me. <laughs> no more death, no more pain, no more cancer, no more cardiovascular disease, no more opioid epidemics, no more death, no more relationships that are torn apart, no more suffering. I don't even think we can understand that in our finite minds. I'm having a hard time, but I'm just telling you, that's the way it's going to be. So let's set the stage. Revelation chapter 1, here we go, introduction. So John, in case you don't know, Revelation was written when John was about 90 plus years old on the island of Patmos. There because he was a prisoner of Emperor Domitian because he was proclaiming the gospel. So he's about 90 years old on a rock quarry. So John outlived all the other apostles. So I guess it was true that John, in fact, was the apostle that Jesus loved. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure when John got to heaven, he probably told Peter, see, I told you, he loved me more. And I could just see Peter going, bam, right? No, he didn't, because there's no more sorrow and suffering in heaven. So here we go, Revelation chapter 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him, to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is near. Notice the flow of information here. From God the Father, to Jesus the Son, to the angel, to John to you and I. That's how the information flows down. Notice the blessing. This is the only book in the Bible, the only book in the Bible that says there's a blessing if you read it and do what it says. Now, I would submit to you, every, all 65 books, there's a blessing if you read them. But it is significant that this is the only book that says you will be blessed if you read it. Is that not significant? I would place significance on that. So that is a beatitude. A blessing statement. Revelation has seven blessing statements. This is the first beatitude in the book of Revelation. It has seven. Revelation is a literary work of art. The numerology in this book is fantastic. Not only are there seven beatitudes, there are seven trumpet judgments, seven seal judgments, seven bowl judgments. There are seven churches. And oh, by the way, the tribulation is seven years long. God doesn't make any mistakes. This is a literary work of art. But you are blessed if you read this book. Does everybody read this book? Yeah. Thank God. Thank God. Praise God. Does anybody ignore this book? Nobody ignores this book. Okay. Because if you did ignore this book, you would not be alone. Because some people don't like this book because of the symbolism or because it's a little scary, right? Because the beast comes up out of the ocean. Because the locusts eat people for five months. I get it. It's a little freaky sometimes, right? In fact, some of the great fathers of the faith did not even trust this book. In fact, John Calvin, if you're a Calvinist in here, you know John Calvin, right? Calvin wrote commentaries on every book of the Bible except Revelation. Martin Luther, we all know Martin Luther, right? Martin Luther didn't even think Revelation was scriptural. <laughs> didn't really trust it, kind of freaked him out. So if you don't read this book, you're not alone. But let me encourage you to read it because, again, you are blessed if you do. And it should be easy to find, right? It's the last book in the Bible. <laughs> so you should be able to find this book, amen? That last verse said, the time is near. 
Now, I know what you're thinking. He wrote this 2,000 years ago. It doesn't seem like the time is near, Jim. But a better translation in the Greek is not that the time is near, but when these events start to happen, they will happen very quickly. And in fact, when the tribulation starts, it will last only seven years. And it will happen rapidly. That's a better translation of that text right there. So, let me ask you a question. Can I ask you a question? Yes. We're like on a first name basis here. That's cool. You okay, Brittany? Just checking. All right. Is that me? I'm moving out of my zone there. Have you ever wanted to be at a scene in the Bible? Is there like a scene in the Bible you think, man, I would have loved to have been there, right? What you got? Garden of Eden, right? That would have been fantastic. What you got? When Mary and Joseph left Jesus and started preaching to the Woo. Amen. Amen, right? So how about when Moses parted the Red Sea to be able to walk across, right? Or when Jesus fed the 5,000 with the loaves and the fishes. Or how about when Shadrach, and Ame- Shadrach Meshach, and Abednego, why couldn't they have like John, James, and Peter? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked out of the fiery furnace. Well, that'd have been awesome, right? I don't know about you, I would have loved to have been there to scoop some sand out of the Red Sea. Or perhaps even taste the loaves and the fishes. That would have been awesome. Or maybe smell the smoke from the fire when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked out to see the king's face. But I wasn't there, and I'm never going to be there. I can't experience those events. But I submit to you, brothers, sisters, that the events we're going to look at today Dependent on your theology and your salvation, you will actually be present at these events. I don't think you heard me. Well, we're going to read about today three scenes. You may actually be there. Come on. That gets me excited. So you got to use your imagination with the book of Revelation. So as we read these scenes, picture yourself right there, you and John, buddy, buddy, in these scenes. Can you do that? Amen. Okay, here we go. Scene number one, Revelation chapter five. And I, John, saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back and sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Now notice strong angel. You don't see that anywhere else in scripture. That means this is either Michael or Gabriel. This is a powerful angel, okay, strong angel, proclaimed with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look at it. So I, John, wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, let me stop there. In chapter 4, we're introduced to these 24 elders. Okay, 24 elders and four living creatures. Revelation is symbolic. Four living creatures. They look a little scary, but that's okay. They're in the throne room of God. So four living creatures, 24 elders. This is one of the elders that says to John, Do not weep, for behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Verse 6, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne... I hope you're really imagining this, right? This is the throne room of heaven. We're not just in heaven. We're in the throne room of heaven. Can you imagine any kingdom, any throne? Multiply that by a million. This is the throne room of heaven. Put yourself there. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. So he was told it was going to be a lion, right? He's expecting Simba, right? But he turns around and it's a lamb. But notice the lamb is standing, right? That signifies that the lamb overcame. In John 16, 33, Jesus overcame the world. This lamb has overcome. Stood a lamb as it though had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the world, and he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, I know what you're thinking. Lambs don't have seven horns, and they don't have seven eyes. And you would be absolutely correct. The symbolism here is, in Scripture, a horn represents power or authority. 
Seven is the number of perfection. So what this references is complete and perfect power in the Lamb, the Son of God. Amen? Seven eyes means he sees absolutely everything. And for you and I as believers, that should give us great comfort. He sees your sorrow. He sees your pain. He sees your dreams. He sees your struggles. He sees everything. That should be a great comfort to you and I. Amen? Amen. And seven spirits, seven spirits here meaning the Holy Spirit. This is a reference to the Holy Spirit. Verse 8. Now, when he had taken the scroll from the four living creatures, and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp, Ever wonder where they got all those paintings with harps? Right? Bingo, right here. In case you were wondering, it's right there. And golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Do you ever wonder where your prayers go? Does it ever feel like you pray and it stops at the ceiling? Does it ever feel like your prayers are maybe deleted or purged? Did did you see where they are? I don't think you saw it. They're right there in the throne room of God. Your prayers, every single prayer you've ever prayed is right there in the throne room of God. In this amazing scene, in God's throne room, every prayer you ever prayed. For anybody, for healing, for salvation, for mercy, for grace, for finances, every single prayer in the throne room, and it's a sweet savor and incense to God. Don't ever stop praying. In fact, if nothing else, the importance of prayer should be revealed right here. Keep on praying. 2019, pray more. Dig in and pray more. Amen? So the four living creatures and the 24 elders are holding these massive bowls of prayers. Let me show you something else. Not to be controversial, but there are a number of Bible scholars who believe that these 24 elders represent you the church, symbolically. So think this through with me. If that is true, and I'm not saying it is, but if that is true, if these 24 elders represent you and I, then I am standing in the throne room with a bowl of the prayers that I have ever prayed, and they are a sweet savor to God in the throne room. If that doesn't get you excited... Praise God. You in the throne room with all the prayers, and they are a sweet fragrance to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's continue. Psalm 142 said, May my prayers be set before you like an incense. Continuing on. And they sang a new voice. I hope you can sing when you get to heaven. Because I know you're going to give me a new voice. Because I'm going to need it. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on earth. I don't think you heard me. It said, you have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on earth. Do you feel like a king today? Because you're a king in waiting. Amen? It gets better. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. And they encircled the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature, I said every creature, (laughs) every creature is going to worship our King. Every single creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. Now, why are these sealed? What's in this? Why is this so important? What's in this seal? Does anybody know? Help me out. I think I heard it. In chapter 6, we see this scroll begin to be opened. The seals are broken, and the scroll is open. It's the seven seal judgments. The seventh seal judgment is the trumpet judgments, seven. The seventh trumpet judgment is the bowl judgments, seven. And the rest of Revelation. So what is in this scroll 
is the, the story of Revelation and the revelation of Jesus Christ as king. That's why John is weeping. If this scroll is not open, the story stops. It doesn't continue. But it has to continue. That's what's in these scrolls. That's why they're so important. The first four judgments of the seal judgments, you've heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? The Antichrist, war, famine, and death. But the Lamb does what no one else in heaven or earth can do. And we see in that one verse the theme, the entire theme of Revelation. He's expecting to see a lion, but he sees a lamb. And that's the entire theme of this book. Jesus going from lamb to lion of the tribe of Judah, becoming king of kings and lord of lords. Now, in verse 6, let me show you something. John sees a little lamb who still has the scars because it appeared to be slain. Even today, in the throne room, Jesus still bears the scars from the cross for you and me. Even today. And for all time and eternity, he will still bear the scars from Calvary. That same hand that Thomas looked at, that Thomas examined to see, was it really him? That same hand that the Romans pounded to a cross, that same hand that Jesus willingly laid down so they could drive a stake through it, that same hand, you will be able to see and touch the scars for all time and eternity in worship to him. That should get you excited. Praise God. In the Old Testament, we see the lamb on an altar, right? We see him in the Passover doorpost. In the Gospels, we see him on the cross. And now in Revelation, this lamb is on the throne. The Passover was a foreshadowing of Calvary, of the cross. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 13, the blood, whatever happened to the songs about the blood? The old hymns of the blood, remember? Are there any blood songs on Caleb or Promise? I don't think so. Believers, we can't get away from the blood. The blood. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Moses was told to tell the Israelites to put blood on the doorpost, and when the angel of death comes through, he will pass over. It's the same for you and I. It pointed to the cross. Amen. The Israelites weren't saved because they were descendants of Abraham. They weren't saved because they were good or perhaps they were good workers. I'm sure they were, but that's not why they were passed over. They were passed over because the blood was on the doorpost. And for you and I as believers, we're not saved because we're good because we're not, right? Amen. We're not saved because my parents are saved or because our pastor is an awesome pastor. We're saved because of the blood of the Lamb washes my sins away. That's it and the story. And when you get to heaven, it's going to be, is the blood washing your sins? That's it. That's the barometer. End of story. We need to remember the blood. Okay, scene two. We fast forward now to the end of the tribulation. Revelation 19, 16. Here we go. Are you with? You still with me? All right, just checking because y'all got quiet there for a second. That's my worst nightmare. Like, you, know, you have these nightmares while you're preaching, and you look out, and there's like nobody there. <laughs> Was it that bad? I mean, they all, they all left. What? Here we go, Revelation 19. I saw heaven standing open. I saw heaven standing open. So this is the second time in Revelation that the door to heaven is actually open. The first time we see is in chapter 4. Here we see again a second time now. I saw heaven standing open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider was called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. The second time, my friends, he's coming to judge and to make war with those who oppose him. So all those coexist bumper stickers, all those one world, one religion bumper stickers, sorry. That's, he's coming. Those who oppose, if you're not for him, you oppose him, Right? And he's coming to make war and to judge those folks. He's not going to be a nice little lamb this time. He's a roaring lion, right? And he's coming to make war and to judge the nations. And his eyes are like a blazing fire. And on his head are many crowns. 
And he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. And he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, not his blood here. It's dipped in blood. And his name is the Word of God. And here's where you come in. I hope you can ride a horse. <laughs> if not, I think April can give you some lessons. I'm going to just say it. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on a white horse, riding on white horses, and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress with the fury of the wrath of God. On his robe and on his thigh is a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. And that, my friends, is the second coming of Christ. Let's look at the comparison. The first time he came, he rode in on a donkey. The second time he comes in on a beautiful white stallion. He came in as a suffering servant the first time. The second time he will come as king and lord. The first time he came in humility and meekness. The second time he's coming in majesty and power. The first time he came to suffer the wrath of God for sinners, you and me. He will come to establish the kingdom of God and for his saints. The first time he was rejected by many as Messiah. The second time he will be recognized by all as Lord. He came to seek and to save the lost the first time. The second time he will come to judge and to rule as king. The first time he came as God incognito, he will come as God in all his splendor the second time. And he was crowned with all God's authority. Now, let me show you something in these verses. You're on a white horse, but you don't have a weapon. You do not have a weapon. You're marching into battle into the biggest battle of all time. A battle that has raged from before the Garden of Eden. When Satan fell out of heaven, the battle started then. It continued at Eden. It continued at the cross. It continues to this day. It is the battle of all battles. And in the end time, Satan will convince, the Antichrist will convince 200 million men from the east to march towards Israel. And they will cross over the dry river Euphrates. And an army will come down from the north. So battled... Battle troops here, at least 400 million men, ready to do battle, convinced by the Antichrist that they can defeat God. And that's the battle you're marching into. And you don't have a weapon. Because you don't need a weapon. Because he is king of kings and lord of lords. <laughs> Satan will convince them that they can win. Seven years of tribulation, people will still turn and curse God. Several times in Revelation, it says there was silence in heaven as he allowed men the opportunity to repent, to turn back to him. And still it says they cursed God. And here at the end of the tribulation period, 400 million soldiers will gather because they think they can beat God. Watch this. This is my favorite verse. Revelation 17, 14. They will wage war against the Lamb. Over 400 million people will wage war against the Lamb. But the Lamb will triumph. Here's what excites me about that verse. This is the battle of all battles. It's been brewing for eons and eons. It will finally come to a climax. There's 400 million soldiers. I would expect chapter upon chapter of battle back and forth, right? One army overcomes the other army. Back and forth. No, 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 no. The lamb will, four words, the lamb will triumph. Done. It's not even a battle. The lamb will triumph. Let me ask you another question, Journey. If at the biggest battle of all time, you're there, you're a participant, but you don't have a weapon because he's fighting your battle, do you think he'll do the same thing in your daily skirmishes? Yeah, you, you know it, right? Yes. 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 Why do you keep fighting your own battles? I don't mean to be a little tough today, but let me ask it again. Why do you keep fighting your own battles? Let me ask you in love, Journey. Stop fighting your own battles. 
We sang earlier, this is how I fight my battles. I love that song. This is how I fight my battles. Let him fight your battles. If you don't know what that looks like, you got a faith family here, a church family. Gather around somebody who will pray with you. Walk through that with you, right? What does that look like to let him fight your battles? You have brothers and sisters who will help you with that. In 2019, stop fighting your own battles. Let him fight them for you. Revelation 22, scene number three. The last chapter of the Bible. 66 books, and here we are. Revelation 22, the last chapter in all the Bible. So this is actually after the tribulation, after Armageddon, after the millennial reign of Christ, after the great white throne judgment. Now we have a new heaven and a new earth. And it says this. Then the angel showed me the river of water, the river of the water of life, as clear, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. You ever wonder if you're going to eat in heaven? Yeah, you will. You're going to eat the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? Yeah, there'll be food in heaven, so don't worry, right? I know with a journey small group, if you have food, they will come. Just, just telling you. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. Whew. That really just said, no longer will there be any more curse. We have been under a curse since the day I was born. Since 6,000 years ago, I have been under a curse, as have you. There will be no more curse. I don't even think we know how to live absent a curse. The curse will be gone. Heard the hallelujah choir there for a second. No more curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city. His servants will serve him. They will see his face. Whew. In Exodus 33, God told Moses, nobody can see my face or they will die. But absent the curse and absent sin in our lives, we can see God face to face. And his name will be on their foreheads. In Revelation, the mark of the beast was received by those who would serve the Antichrist. They received the mark. Here we receive the mark of our God and King, meaning we are his. We belong to him. Don't uh, denotes ownership. And there will be no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. So we will be nourished by God. We will worship our God. We will see our God. And we will reign with our God. He will be our King of kings and our Lord of lords. And I got to ask you today, Journey, is he your king of kings? Is he your Lord of lords? But everybody stand with me. The battle of the end of the age, but only those who are on his side. Today can be the day. If he's not your king of kings, if he's not your Lord of lords, today's the day. It's that simple. It's the blood. Amen. The blood. And the other audience I want to talk to, if you're still fighting your battles, man, today is the day. Let him fight your battles. Amen. Amen. Bow your heads and pray with me. And I got to ask you today, if you're in here today and Jesus is not your Lord and he's not your king, but you want to make that declaration today, that proclamation, I'm going to ask you in a second to raise your hand. And if you're in here today and you've been fighting your battles and it is a losing battle, and you know that it's time to let him fight your battles, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in a second too. And then we're going to end a little differently this year, Journey. We're going to sing, this is how I fight my battles. And I'm going to do it as a faith family. I want to pronounce to our God and to the enemy that we as a body of believers together 
surrounded by each other here at the order. That's how we're going to fight our battles in 2019. So I'm going to ask you in a second, everybody to come to the altar, if you will, with my freedom folks leading the way. Amen? But if you're in here today, heads bowed, eyes closed, you've never said yes to that king, that Lord. And today is the day you want to do that. Just raise your hands so we know who we're praying for. Amen. Amen. And if you're in here today and you're still fighting your battles and you say enough is enough, today I want him to fight my battles, would you raise your hand as well? That's what I thought. Thank you, Jesus. See that proclamation. Now I want to ask you, faith family, everybody who just raised their hand and everybody in here who wants to go out on a big note, right? This is how we fight our battles. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. I'm going to be surrounded by our faith family here at the altar. As we sing, if you would, please come, gather. Let's sing this song and proclaim it for 2019. Amen.
worship, our praise is our thanksgiving, Jesus. Lord, we move into 2019, God, knowing that, Lord, you are fighting our battles, knowing, God, that we can trust in you. So, God, we give you this time. God, we surrender it to you. We surrender 2019 to you. May you just take, take it and do your will and your way in our lives, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah. Come on, give God praise one more time. Come on, lift it up. Yes. 